Okay, everybody. I, <laughs> what I want to make, welcome. So after this one, are we select board people comfortable getting together in person downstairs again? I'm getting tired of this stuff. I like to see. Yes, that. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think we're all pretty careful, and it's now obviously it's um, it's okay. I think with the with the governor's guidelines, if we do something like this, I think we'd still want any. Well, we could even see if we have giant things, give people always the option to call in. But um, we have plenty of space down there, even if somebody decides they want to come in. I think we'll put up. We'll see down here. We're going to talk about reopening the buildings and and guidelines for it, but. So let's let's uh, assume all and and again, if somebody doesn't feel comfortable doing it, or you think you have a cold, or you just can't bear the sight of us, it's okay to stay on the phone. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I'm definitely I'm getting done with this. I'm gonna I'm gonna. I, there are times where I just think about throwing the phone out. Okay, let's see. The first thing is, uh, Andrew, that I don't know, Ron, what you wanted, we'll figure out if you want to come up or we'll run it and we'll still need the meetings run like this somehow or other. So we'll keep, we'll keep Carol on the, on the hook for a while. Um, yeah, you've all saw, it's yeah. It's a mechanical the, thing. I'm trying to figure it out. So whatever, whatever yeah. the, I think the governor is going to loosen up things definitely by the 15th. Your next meeting isn't the, until the 18th. Right. Right. Um, Besides, we spend so much time together, we can say we're related, right? It's our extended family. The uh, okay, <laughs> advertising. See the ad for the uh, for the for Roger Berry's um, opening. Um, that just appeared. Yep, that was just a reminder that the uh, letters of interest are due May fifteenth, and it was advertised yesterday. And then we'll put a couple front porch forum postings out this weekend. So. That's about all we can do. Yeah, yeah. Well, see, see what happens. But when did when did we decide to post that? Sure, last meeting in I don't know what it was uh, three weeks ago maybe. Oh, because yeah. I thought yeah. we uh, we had decided on there we were going to see if um, if David was going to step in temporarily until March. No, no, the, the decision of the board was to advertise if we got Roger's letter, which we did. Okay. I don't well, remember I, that. I, yeah, I, I think legally we have to we have to let the universe know anyway. We we I don't think we can just go to okay, <laughs> here's our replacement. So I think for it to be legal we have to we have to post and that if uh um if no one's interested or we don't, you know, who knows? Maybe there'll be hundreds of people that are interested in coming and joining this group. Um, okay. And then I'd say if we don't hear anything, we can we can uh, talk to David. But the select board has the right to appoint somebody, right, Susan? Yes, we have the right to appoint. Even if a bunch of people apply, we we don't have to go to an election. We have the right to appoint. We just have to let people know that there's an opening. Okay. Okay. Nope. Thank you. Like you have the yeah. responsibility to appoint, and then you 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 don't have a right. You, it's a responsibility to seek and make an appointment as soon as possible until the next election when the voters can make a decision. So it's it's nor it's all good. It's all normal. It's fine. Okay. Because uh, let's see. Yep. I did reach out to Dave when you asked me there. Right. And um and he said he would be interested in and he told I don't know if he's talked to you since, but he said he talked to you at town meeting, I think it was when I talked to him. And yeah, um, yeah, he, he said did. that you know, he said that he would be willing to help out any way possible. Right. Right. Okay. Um all right, the town garage project update. Brian. <clears throat> yes. Um the uh, oil water separator, um, I was in contact or tried to get in contact with the, um, uh, well, let's, let's go back. I said, <coughs> went up to the garage. We looked at the, the current plan that was provided to me by Roger Berry. And um, uh, I feel that there can be some modifications uh, to it to save some money. And uh, 
basically is just joining some of the, uh, I'm going to call them uh, gutters or drains in the garage, put a pipe between two of them, and then drain it all out to one one pipe or two pipes going out, two or three pipes actually going out, and uh, into one oil water separator. Right now, the current plan says two of them. And the concerns are uh, the trucks running over either the pipes or the actual oil water separator. It's like a big sewer tank is what it looks like, concrete. But I don't think it will be a good idea to put the trucks over those. It'll be right where they put the sand up. They'll be running back and forth over them with full loads. And that's a concern. So um, uh, I'm, th I'm thinking about putting the oil water separator over by where the uh, um, dumpsters are over in that area and back far okay. enough so if we do yeah when we put the um we put the uh extra add-on the addition onto the garage it won't interfere with that either so uh um now i've sent i made up a, a drawing of how uh the new plan would look and i sent it uh or i took a picture of it and i sent it to the uh um Engineer Clark, uh, I don't remember his last name. Elliot. But, um, Elliot, yes, thank you. And um, he hasn't got back to me. I've tried to reach him twice, left messages. The first time that I tried to reach out to him, it took him over a month to get back to me. So <clears throat> I'm going to be a little more persistent with him. Um, I'll still be friendly, but uh, I um, uh, will try to get back. Get uh, get him to okay that uh, that modification to it, and if it is, then we're going to have to start proceeding pretty quick before we get fined. Now, another addition to another idea to it is the way that I'm uh, that we have discussed it and seen this the, where the pipes where the pipes come out of the um, the garage. They they go underneath the side of the doors and if I if we can I'd like to avoid having to dig those pipes up and that skirting to save us a ton of money yeah and so I think I think the best thing to do is um, um, is to run a scope down those pipes out underneath the skirting to see if there's any damage to them and if they're in good shape there's no need of digging them all the way back up into the garage. So then what we do is we'd go out beyond the skirting and the paved skirting, and then we connect all the pipes together and run it over to our uh, uh, oil water separator in there. Now, another thing too, just so everybody's aware of it, is that the uh, with having one oil water separator to the two, the frequency of pumping would be uh, uh, different. We'd have to pump it out uh, more often. Comments? How? Yeah. Do you have any idea how often those things need to be pumped, and is it possible to have a bigger tank? I believe it's possible to have a bigger tank, and I haven't looked into that. And I was hoping the engineer would uh, uh, possibly make a suggestion uh, like that. I want to make sure we go through uh, uh, Mr. Elliot and. Um, so, yeah, it uh, that that's a possibility to uh, to do it that way. And, and so, what was the other part of your question, Susan? No, I just wondered how often you you know you you they need to be pumped. That's one of those you have to figure out long term. I'm I'm sure a larger tank costs more money. I think, but that's I a, think that's Roland, a permanent solution. Yeah. Yeah, I think Roland could answer to that because he has experience with them. If you probably um, would have to pump that maybe once a year, but I would say it might go every two years. It depends on a big thing, but I would say one to two years. The first time, you probably better do it in a year just to see where we are. And the next yeah, time, yeah. you might be able to get by maybe three years you know, but every, the first time is going to be the tricky one to see, but I would have it pumped the first time in one year 
and then we could tell, well, okay, we only got 110 gallons of oil out of it, you know, and we got a capacity of 500 gallons of oil. So we'll know more about it then. Is, is, how, what do we have to do to dispose of the oil? And I guess my question with the oil, is that the sort of oil that can be used for fuel, for, you know, for heat? No. No, okay. it cannot be used for fuel. It's waste oil, and there's a company out of New Hampshire that does that. Yes, it's costly, okay. but it's what they want. <laughs> you know, what, yeah, that's okay. With, yeah, I, I ain't gonna say what I'm thinking, but I will tell you that we need to get it in. Oh yeah, yeah, we're we're way overdue on getting this project done. I think Brian's on the right track and getting them connected because that one line that goes out behind the salt shed, Brian, that one keeps freezing yes. up in winter. Yes, it does. That that one does. Uh, um, they were talking about that that it uh, caused issues over the winter, so we would we, we would yeah we would be uh, eliminating that one or. Rather than me say that we would, yeah, we would totally eliminate that one. It would freeze up. And then we would channel all the uh, water uh, out the other three uh, that are there. And I know for a fact that I've seen some <clears throat> stuff down there. And we need to definitely hop on to this. And I think everybody agrees as quickly as possible. Do you have any idea what the cost is? I haven't because I was waiting to hear back from the engineer. The engineer, okay, all right. I, 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 I can, I can pretty much assure that it would save us thousands of dollars if we go this uh, modified route. Oh yeah, I'm not well, and I just, Ron, how much money do we have aside for? I, I still think we're in. The, yeah, I still think we're in the thirty, thirty thousand range, probably somewhere there. Okay. So, It'll cover the it'll cover this project. Right, right, okay. And I will say that we will need to get a bigger excavator in there because the last one I did, it's got to be deep, and this one will have to be deep, and we couldn't even pick it up with the excavator we had, and we had a big one. We couldn't even pick it up. We had to get Minosh down there and look at it, and Minosh couldn't even set it with their crane. So we ended up getting Showband oh. to come down yeah. and set it up with their crane. So it's 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 a process. It's it's a big process, right? Right. Well, at least Showband's close. <laughs> no, you're yeah, right. Let me, let me, Roland. Yeah. Let me let me ask the people that deliver it. Could they set it? Well, there was a reason why we didn't get them to set it, and we had it delivered the fall before. If it's ready, I'm sure they can deliver it, and they can set it, but you still are going to be extra cost there, Brian. We'd have to look into that, and being, yeah, so, yeah, we'll, we'll, and being so close, <clears throat> being a resident, they might treat us pretty good, but we'd have to price it out both yeah. ways you would. Yep. As soon as I hear back from the uh, the um, engineer, I'll get a cost uh, uh, estimate on what the thing is going to cost. Everything will be the what it will be, and and we'll look into what it would cost to set it. But uh, our backhoe should be able to dig the uh, or uh, the holes that we're going to need to have. Backhoe is uh, not going to be able to dig that hole for the tank. No. It's just not for the to... tank. No. What What are they saying? The depth is is what? Uh, is it eight feet deep? How How deep is the tank? I definitely let me, let me look. I got it right here. It'll be at least eight. Oh. Eighteen. I think we were down with Jerry's big hole. We were down the whole length of it. We were down the the spec. The specs say that um, the tank is five foot four inches, 
and it's got to be covered with two inch two two feet of uh of uh yeah. dirt soil so uh um seven seven feet well that so Brian, if, if if nobody if nobody down there can dig it i'll go down and i'll dig it myself <laughs> it ain't going to be done with our backhoe i can tell you that right because you're going to have that lake <laughs> Brian, the issue is the uh, the run that you're going to have from the front of the building to the new location on that westerly corner of the front lot is going to require it to be deeper than that minimum of eight feet. That's that's a that's a design for pretty much right outside the front of the building. So my guess is you'd be closer to 12 feet probably by the time you get to that new location that you're thinking about. Yep, 15 feet. Yep. Okay. okay. That's uh, that's where it'd be set. So it'd be covered with more than uh, now. I'm trying to think if if we if we're going to be down 15 feet, putting that in there, then what are we going to do as far as when they come to pump it? Do we put a chute over the top of it so they can access it, or what? To come up to the a, uh, level of the ground. Yeah, there's that, a ring that goes on top. Yeah. There's a ring that goes on top, just like sewers. Yeah. Okay. So that'll be an added cost too, but uh, yeah. Well, we we brung ours right up to the top of the blacktop. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So that's where we're at with that. One thing I'd like to mention about the garage, since we're on the garage, is that um, uh, Roger French had mentioned to me that he had talked with Conrad uh, uh, Harris and about finishing up that gable end of the garage it needed some repair and that uh conrad uh had some time available but this was three four weeks ago that he mentioned that to me and it slipped my mind and but i wanted to get the approval of everybody if we could get and if we've got the funds wrong to uh get that uh gable end uh wrapped up on there so it looks halfway decent and it doesn't cost us more money down the road because of the weather affecting it yeah, I don't. Do you remember what his cost was? Wasn't that under like two thousand or something? I can't I, remember. I asked Mark. I asked Mark that, and Mark said that it was something that Roger Berry had uh, uh, had. So uh, uh, we'd probably have to ask uh, Conrad again for the uh, what it would cost. And uh, yeah, let me. I'll follow uh, up with Mark. I, I have some notes I can look at, and then talk to Mark about what that was. I'll send him to you. Okay. Brian, but it sounds, it sounds as though between the two, we ought to be okay within the money that we have set aside. Yeah, I'll, I'll update the budget with Allison based on what we find from Conrad, and I and I don't recall, I don't recall the CEA or uh, produced a cost estimate, but I I don't remember it being crazy, you know. So I think I think there's money, but I'll I'll do a little summary for okay. everybody. Okay, and I say Brian, one minute, What's that, Roland? Brian, I was just going to um, talk to you just for a minute about, are you going to take and um, talk to them about um, getting them gutters cut out and getting them piped up to to one end once this is done? If yeah, you what? You and get a yeah, camera once, in there. Once, yeah, once the uh, engineer approves uh, uh, the most recent uh, design, I guess, uh, um, if that's done, then we'll go forward and I'll get all those uh, costs and stuff like that and figure out what it's going to cost us for that. Oh, okay. So, I, 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 like I said, I've called and left messages for this uh, uh, Mr. Elliott, and I haven't heard back from him, which I was hoping to. So, uh, uh, I will try Mr. Elliott again today and tell him that there's some urgency on this and uh, to please uh, get back to me. and. Uh, Maybe I'll look up his home address. That's one of my favorite things to do. If uh, they don't answer my phone call, sometimes I go visit them. So. It works. Well, yeah, I am. It's I'm, effective. And yeah, I'm sure. It's um, when when you get stuff and you and Ron have we've got to figure it out, just sort of give a quick email to us because I think what we want to do is is um as soon as we have the information to be able to give the the go ahead we're a week and a half so you may not have the next select board meeting may be fine but if miraculously in a 
you know, the beginning of the week we have it, we, we might want to just do a quick phone call or if everything, the numbers look okay, then now go ahead and say you got the authority to, you know, to go ahead and have the have the guys start. Yep, yep, I agree. I'm on board. Okay. Um, thank you, Brian, for all that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. How about so reopening the town buildings and facilities and and the process and what we want to go through? That's why we've got to, got Kim on the phone. Kim, did our did the crabby guy get in for his stuff yesterday? Yeah, he did. Kristen said he was he was decent. <laughs> Well, I think that's an upgrade. <laughs> yeah, those were her words. He was decent. Yeah. I was like, okay. <laughs> did, did he get everything done? Sounds like it. Okay, that's good. So, in in terms of of uh, of reopening and how we reopen and the and the and the plan and what we need to do and keeping people safe. Um, and we have to obviously think about because the you know the the village water and light is is right there as well as we all know it's a very tiny office so keeping people you know I think six feet is a minimum kind of a kind of a thing um, whether the uh, run is the plexiglass in so we get that up and what kind of what kind of process we want to do I think. I think folks working at home is going to be part of the future for a long time uh, um, to come that we need to think about as people start to, if they want to come into the office, how we facilitate that because it's obviously you get jammed right up at the door. There isn't, you can't really keep people six feet apart in that entryway. You, know, you really just need one person at a time in there. So just beginning to think out the steps and what we need to what we need to do and 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 all of that and I, I'm sure Kim you and Ron I know have been talking about it what do you how do you think we should move forward with this um I'll go I'll go first because I want to make sure everybody understands sort of the um the regulatory world we have to continue to operate under <laughs> so there are there is some flexibility that Kim and Amy will need to come up with in the sense of the details of the opening uh, the select board and, and and the way it's forming its uh, structure is uh, is written down or memorialized in what they call the COVID-19 exposure control work plan. So every every employer has to adopt this document that is available to VOSHA for enforcement purposes uh, and complaints, as well as available to employees. Oh. And so if somebody comes in the office basically and says, okay, I'm here to, you know, start my first day of work with you guys, you know, we have to provide that training for new people. We have to provide it upon request. And the document that VLCT drafted uh, as a template is much more concise than the first version that uh, ACCD recommended. So I, I'm, I'm making the recommendation we go with the VLCT template which is basically just assigning duties and uh, giving some protocols and some minimum requirements like face mask when there's uh, uh, public is in the office and six feet apart that Susan mentioned. The plexiglass shields are an alternate to face masks. So if you had one person in your office behind the reception desk, they don't have to wear a mask if the face shield is up, the plexiglass shield. So all those things are contained in the work plan. Um, the other part that was required by the order was the training of employees, which we finished uh, Monday this week. So everybody's been trained with the uh, required VOSHA training and we have certificates for everybody. Uh, so that was another thing to check off. This work plan, which is on the agenda today, is the reopening plan. And it's the one that will finish up and have effective a certain date, which I we can have it effective today if we get through it. And then the plan that's drafted also allows for library and town office to make up a, sort of a smaller list of internal protocols that are very specific to their workspaces. 
So that's how it's going to go forward. Uh, we're, the town has to adopt a work plan. It has to be available across all departments, and then individual departments uh, have to administer it. So it, the the tricky part is the enforcement. So we've had some news. If you've been watching the news, you'll see some people objecting to face masks, for example, and some shop owners having to boot people out. So each department head, uh, which would be Ed Webster, Amy Olson, Kim, and Mark French would be responsible for enforcement. Um, I'll take the role of the oversight of each department to make sure people are following things as well as the boards and committees because they're subject to the same rules. And if there's any issues with people objecting to come in or, um, or you know, department head refusing access, those I think we need to know about that between you and uh, the select board and, and myself right away. We can deal with it. I'm hoping that most people are compliant and that nobody has to get there. But you never you never know who's going to walk through the door if the doors are now open with certain protocol. I know Amy Olson had some stepped up plans that they're working with the Department of Library, uh, whether they open up right away or whether they do a curbside this week or next week, and then they figure out how to let people in is something that they're going to work on. We're, we, you know, my office or the select board won't be getting into those details. They'll be the Amy and the trustees will deal with the details, but they will be subject to this work plan, which has the general um, protocol for public and staff interactions. I think that's the whole thing in a nutshell. I don't know if anybody has any questions with that uh, or if, if Kim has something more to add about what she sees in her office because that her office are obviously in library are the ones that will deal with the public on a on a ongoing day-to-day -day basis moving forward. Um, well, the one thing that I think we would have to do is you mentioned, you know, when the sneeze guard is up, which is not up yet. We have them in the office. I need to get my husband to come in and help me put them up. Um, when the sneeze guard is up, then you know the, the you said the mask being optional, um, potentially optional. Our office is small enough that it's very difficult for two people to, um, you know, socially distant, physically distant, whatever you want to call it, when you're up and moving around. It's one thing if you're sitting at your desk and you're not doing anything but you know we're going to the vault we're going to the copier we're going to the tax binders we're going to the lister cards you know and we're constantly moving um so i think in in my office whether the plexiglass is, is well it will be up i still think that kristen and i are and and whoever is in the office <coughs> on our side of the wall i think we need to keep those masks on until you know it's i guess prudent to not and, and time will tell when we feel like you know we can relax that part of it may, may i say something mr brian of course sure. yeah well, okay um so yes the mask stay on even if the shield's up the shield is between you and the public and you two are working right. within the six foot uh six foot uh, uh, con you're in the confines so you're within that six foot period so the mask stay on now I think in there and Ron correct me if I'm wrong that we're supposed to start taking temperatures um, people's temperatures and as an indicator of early warning of possible somebody being affected so the both of you uh, would take your temperature when you first start today you know, that's what we're doing at the facilities we're taking our temperatures or they're taking them and uh and if there's any signs that is the early warning sign to stop the contact so you can't do it to the public as they're coming through but you can do it to each other as a as a heads up type of thing what do you think yeah the, yeah, the order said if if feasible to this the extent that not everybody has thermometers They've been ordered, I was, just uh, haven't been delivered yet. I'm sorry, what was that, Kim? They Ron ordered the thermometers, they just haven't been delivered yet. Yeah. Um, well, you can also, I think we get, you know, if uh, 
Kim, for you guys, if doing part of it, if for some days of the week you're not both in the office but the other one is working at home, that can certainly work. And I would think, um, you know, we have the guy locally who's doing the face shield. And oh, yeah. as, opposed to, as opposed to wearing a mask all day, I think, I think getting those would be much more comfortable. Um, Definitely. Yeah, we can we can see about getting those, right, Ron? Oh yeah, we can ask him. Or he's he just received a a whole bunch more material, so I'm thinking he's he's in it for the long haul as needs arise. Right. So the other thing the other thing that I have to plan out is you know my office is not just my office. The lister has space in that open area, so we have to coordinate our schedules. Right now, it's supposed to be not more than two people in the office, the employee and another employee or the employee and potentially a researcher. So, you know, when we do make appointments, we're going to have to plan accordingly that Julie knows she can't come in on this day or we don't make appointments on that day because that's the day she's coming in or, you know, it's all following whatever the governor updates for you know, so many people in certain spaces, which I've been following pretty closely. Um, but for right now, it's still two. And if that changes, then we'll accommodate for that. But, you know, it's still playing that flexible schedule thing to make sure that everybody's work needs are being met. And you're also still trying to get, you know, a few people into the vault to do what they need to do. Right, and I think that's where one of you working at home certain days a week, and it might be, you know, again, sort of figuring out a schedule for, I'm just picking a month for no reason other than I'm picking a month, you know, but sort of a tentative schedule for a month that here, these days, you will you will work at home, so that leaves the space, that would be the days that somebody could come in to use the vault and that kind of thing, or when Julie needs yeah. to come in or whatever. I think that one of the, um, I'm going to say an issue because it's something that we need to re work through, you know, with schools closed, Kristen still is doing remote learning until mid-June when school is out. And exactly. Each of, her, each of her three kids have specific online um, sessions, if you will, through Zoom or online classroom or something where one is doing it at, on these days at this time and another one's doing it on these days at that time. She's got this crazy school schedule and it's changing every week. So every week her and I work out what our following okay. week schedule is going to be based on her schedule. And that's kind of when we do go back to something a little bit more regular until school is out, she's still only going to be able to work a half of a day. Right. And the other right. half, the other half would be at home. Right. Silly me. I thought the schools would have a regular schedule for kids. Okay. Oh gosh, no. <laughs> oh, Kristen, they change every week, and it's it's just she's going crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. And again, obviously, you guys just there's there's the flexibility you're, you know that that you need, but it's. Um, for everybody and everything, we just we just need to be flexible and work it out the best we can. Um, yeah. I don't know. Anybody? We, do we do we want to in making this change? They um, start being a little more open next week because Kim, you've already worked out here are the guidelines when somebody calls and they need to make an appointment. And people coming in are definitely have to be on an appointment system. Um, you've right. got a, you've got you've got good lot guidelines. Um, yeah, we're, we're doing appointments in the morning on the days that I'm there, and on um, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So if it's me that's there that day, that's in the morning. If it's Kristen's there that's that day, it's the afternoon. Yeah, Susan, I think I think each department 
in, in particular the staff schedules will follow the governor's order and your well this draft um draft plan that the select board needs to adopt so the details are are more of a communication thing to the public and the select board about how the plan is being implemented so if we if we focus on getting the plan done today which, which says all these things that you're talking about the actual details of what the schedule is or who does what or whether it's a school thing aren't but they're not really covered in the plan because it's almost too much detail the plan is really just well right right open up use your six feet wear a mask use the shield it says all those things that people are going to have to decide on which is a sort of a changing target with the governor changing everything but at least we can get the plan done that has all those protocols uh, to to use and then the right. department will report back out to the public and the select board how things are going and you know who that, that's the best we can do at this point so I, I think between the select board order to reopen buildings uh but be in compliance with the governor's order and the town's uh control plan i i think that's as far as we can get today and then departments can bring up issues as they occur uh to me or you or, the, or potentially the full select board if there's a if there's a day-to-day -day issue and i i I did communicate to Ron when he first sent out the draft order um, that my concern was the draft order. I'm looking at it again just to make sure. Um, it basically is saying departments and committees reopen public facilities effective immediately. Um, with precautions set out in the 2020 Hyde Park COVID-19 program and exposure control plan. Um, I don't know, you know, Ron just clarified what my concern was because I, the way that that's worded, people aren't gonna go looking for a control plan. They're gonna show up banging on the door saying the select board said open, so open. Yeah, so exactly. I don't know if there's, I don't know if, there's an extra sentence or two that could be added that you know states, you know, departments are following governor's executive orders or you know something more professionally worded so that it's not appearing as if the, the board set open so now you can go in. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the right we say open so presto the world's back the way it was. Just if there's a clarifying statement in there that, you know, well, you can, yeah, I, and I think you can just change. So I've got two things on the select board action item list. One is the decision to reopen, which we can, I'll talk about in a second. And then there's the plan. The plan on page three of four does make provision for additional protocols, measures that the town clerk and library may do. Uh, under the plan. So those aren't specific. They're just allowing the town clerk and library director to come up with whatever they need to do to have a safe, you know, environment for the public to visit. The the first thing about ordering to reopen, you could you could modify that language, like I think what Kim is suggesting to say, you know, um, we're we're ordering the uh, controlled reopening of town facilities so people know that there's some controls in place something simple like that because the rest of the order that i drafted does say that these other things are in place so the title's a little bit uh weak in the sense of you know giving the impression that you're wide open without constraint right and, uh, and we uh, and go ahead kim sorry i was just saying and we all know based on you know diff different states opening stuff up people aren't really reading anything they're just being open and they're rushing out and I, I don't want you know to show up to work at eight o'clock some morning and you know we're not open yet and having a line of people waiting to get in uh, why can't yeah, we I just why can't we just say that the office is open by appointment like we have been doing, ain't we? If somebody wants to come in, they have to make an appointment to get in. Yeah, that that is part of the that is part of the moving forward. We're we're talking about the semantics of how you do that, which the governor's been struggling with. You know, he used the term spigot a couple times. Uh, with your 
the all the last decision of the board was to shut the properties down you know so that that's what we're trying to deal with today is how do you say we're gradual reopening with conditions you know, that yeah, I think Rod, Rod is right. If we just say it's the gradual reopening beginning with appointments only. You know, it's just like doing a hair appointment or going to the doctors. You have an appointment at a certain time, and that's when you, you'll be there. And, and, if we, and if we change the order to the order to reopen um, beginning by appointment only or something like that, so it's real clear in the one sentence in the capital letters, which is what 99% of the people are going to read, that they need well, I think, to. I think that's good. I think, but the thing we have to deal with those that when you made the motion to close all buildings and facilities, include the, the park, the ball fields, the library, you know, the, the fire station and everything else. So it's not just making an appointment. I think it's order to gradually reopen town facilities with appointments and controls kind of covers everything. Yeah. Yeah, right. <clears throat> yeah. And that, then if people are curious not, about what controls mean, they'll call. Yeah, I think that's that's the challenge for each facility is going to have different ones. So it just it just lets people know that we're moving off the totally closed. And then the, the next motion you have, hopefully, is just the order to reopen. <laughs> this this will be the permanent middle ground one. Right, right. So we don't get too confused with the public. You know, there'll be three steps, the closure, the gra gradual reopen, and then the reopen. Okay, so you think you have the changes you need to put in the- Yeah, I know I've the, made them already. the cover yes. sheet, right. Yeah, yeah, I think we're good. I got the I got that done. So the, mo the, the order select board vote would be the order to gradually reopen the town facility with appointments and control. Yeah. Uh, and then the text of that goes uh, following the governor's stay at home order, select board directs town departments to reopen town facilities with appointments and controls effective immediately and with precautions set out in the 2020 Hyde Park exposure control plan. Town administrator will be the town safety monitor and each department head will have a, will be the designated safety compliance officer for that facility. Uh, all the employees have completed the training and new hires are subject to uh, the training as well. Questions go to the town administrator and select board chair. So that's your basic order. The plan itself is four pages long, which is uh, the template from VLCT. So the, the names and dates have been changed, but the template is pretty much unchanged from what VLCT sent out. Uh, Kim and I looked at that pretty, pretty good yesterday, and I think we both feel it's a good concise document compared to what ACCD offered initially. So oh, definitely. So th that would be the mo the reopen order and the plan or, or the motion that needs to happen to get those adopted. If, if the board does adopt them, then I'll produce a final copy, send it around to all the departments, and then we can amend it as needed going forward. Okay. Folks, good with that? If so, we need a motion and a second. I make the motion question. to move with the plan. Second. Okay. okay. Any more questions or conversation about it? Hey, uh, Ron, will, um, will each department have their own plan set up? Is that what you're saying? They'll have, specifically yeah, they'll, they'll be sub, yeah, they'll be subject to the uh, town select boards planned and and what we just vote we're voting on and then each department that has any supplemental rules or procedures should type those up and make them available as an addendum uh, at their facility and and provide us a copy one yeah one yeah once it's once it's done they should send it to us so I can get it you know send it to yeah. me so I can get it to you and then it should be at the yeah, like office said, if, if it's posted then then uh people like Kim and stuff can point to that rather than them being upset at uh, anybody else. It, it's the policy and procedure that's uh, governing the uh, uh, access to the building. So uh, yes, that's the very case, good. That's well, my vote. So I'm still going to follow the governor's executive order, which town clerk offices are not to be open, but may, may 
be open by appointment is what he's saying. So your what you just passed is is a, is allowing the same thing that the governor's allowing for my office. At such time that the governor is you know saying that clerks can be back open and you know or or more people can be in the office or whatever his updates provide, you know, I will follow right along with his updates, whatever that, are, you know, whatever those are. Yeah, I think the plan and the, I, we're all talking about the same thing. So it's all, everybody's on the same page. We we definitely got to follow the governor's order and the select board's not going to, at least I haven't heard the select board wanting to be more restrictive than the governor's moves. <laughs> no. If, right. if anything, we have to, we just have to follow it and move on and hopefully get this thing over with sooner than later. Okay, we got a motion on the table. Everybody ready? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll creep forward. Okay, Rolly, roundabout maintenance. You gonna be out there with yeah. me? Yeah, we did. Ron and I had a meeting with them. Um, Jim Cota, um, um, Ernie Patno, and I can't remember what the woman's name was, but anyway, they want us to mulch, mole, and take care of the roundabout. But I think the biggest thing that I was concerned about, and we got to have the 48 inch signs. And you need two, four, six, eight. You need two on each side of the roads. Well, all right. We're out there. Maybe we do want it to look better, and maybe we want the state to take care of it because it is their problem. But they can't even give us signs and won't even set up signs. And if I'm not wrong, wrong, Ron, they said they didn't even have any 48-inch signs. Did I get that right? That's what I heard too, surprise, yeah. Okay, you had that too. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, um, they threw out, and I, I, I agree with them 100% that Cambridge, I was down there just a few days ago, and uh, it does look good. You know, they ain't done nothing yet with it, but they've got a lot of tax dollars, and they've, they said a lot of, volunteers have stepped up in Cambridge. Well, you know, you got the third, second biggest contractor right there on the roundabout themselves. And then I guess more so, they, they weren't going to do nothing with the roundabout. Um, the only thing that bothers me is for the taxpayers on a state road that would have to buy the signs and set them up. I don't mind setting them up. But I think the state ought to come up with something before we say yes or no on this to tell us that they would give us some signs so we could have, or they would set the signs up. But your volunteers, a lot of them, you know, with this COBA going on, some of them are definitely going back to work. Some of them are still out. Um, and I think you can find some volunteers. I know the volunteer work is getting very slim in the communities. So um, I guess it's the biggest thing is if the state could come up with some science. And I got, I can't believe that they don't have some help um, to take care of these roundabouts. They said they build this thing, they built the World Trail, they built the roundabout. And they forgot about the maintenance. Um, and that part, I guess we got to talk about it and with the rest of the board members and see what they want to come up with. I said my piece to them the other day. And, you know, that's the way I feel about it for the taxpayers. I mean, you got taxpayers, yeah, they live down there in the village. It might go around them around about three, four times a day. Yeah, they do want it look better. But you got taxpayers up in Garfield that probably don't go by that roundabout only once every month. So, you know, you got to separate this and see what's good and what's not good. And it's just like the state come to us, Ron, 
and they wanted us to plow from the roundabout hellfire down to the town clerk's office. I could never understand. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, I, I, I can't remember how far it was. Do you? Can you help me with that one, Ron? Yeah, it was it was the roundabout to this uh, Cricket Hill. So the high there. school, right? Yeah. 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 Like a mile, oh, okay. so mile and a half. They wanted us. They wanted us to. I can't understand even that one. But um, I guess it's up to the rest of you. I mean, that's kind of the history that Ron and I come up with, but it really, really got my goat is that um, they don't even have the 48 inch signs. They don't have a few out there in this state of Vermont that aren't, you know, signs that they can use every day, but we could use um, half a time, uh, half a dozen times a year. I mean, you know, do that every two weeks. Mulching is going to be the problem there, guys. Mulching is not going to be easy there. I mean, we're going to have to use some of the equipment to get that mulch to the center of that circle. I mean, you know, you, you truck it in, and then Jim Corda said, it's up to $1,000. It's not $1,000. It's up to $1,000. We tried to get them to even say that they would buy some mulch and the lady that was on there wanted Ernie to at least mow it twice a year and he said no so um, um, I have a email from Jane Brown she's the state landscape architect for, for yeah. Vtrans and yeah. uh, I, I can read it. it's not too long but it'll give you a good summary for where she was after that phone call that Roland's talking about uh, Thanks for setting up the call with select board member Roland and VTrans District 8. It's clear that VTrans would only mow once per year. So if your town wants a more attractive roundabout, it'll need to pitch in. Did you get positive comments after the work last summer to clean up the weeds? I hope people noticed. The town asked VTrans to remove lower branches and clean the approaches. And to me, it makes the intersection more visible and safer. I am sorry that we didn't work out an agreement when the roundabout was built for town maintenance of some kind. I recall that we left two areas open in the roundabout for the town to plant annuals. There was an idea that volunteers would be organized to take care of the roundabout landscape. However, that never happened. At the time I was reassigned at VTrans for four years. So this method of landscaping, both the Cambridge and Morrisville roundabouts continued. In hindsight, it was naive to think those roundabouts could be maintained at the level by volunteers. Now we resolve this in the design phase that she's talking about new roundabouts and also greatly simplify the designs we are building. We may be looking at brick chips and small trees in future designs with no grass to trim and no shrubs. I think the Hyde Park roundabout has had a great facelift at VTrans expense last summer and this is an opportunity to get it right going forward. I greatly appreciate the town is considering chipping in. I have outlined in previous emails what I thought was needed. Please let me know if I can be of assistance. So I think what she's saying is that there was a there was a, a goof, omission, whatever, and they over-designed the three roundabouts. Now they're basically coming to the position that they won't do that ever again unless the community wants it to be looking better. I think Waterbury did that. Cambridge is doing that. They had a community group that stepped forward with a partnership with the town and, and the state doing bits and pieces of it. And they look, those two look pretty nice, actually, if you've been through either one of those recently. Um, I don't know what Morrisville's plan is. They're not talking to anybody, so I don't have any you know plans from them. But I almost think that it even though we don't have the big corporations that Roland was talking about, if we put together some sort of maintenance plan looking for donations and community support, the state is committed to that up to a thousand dollars. And I think that's something that we can drill into sort of above the district level and try to get something from VTrans you know, administration to concede some support for the town because it was not totally our fault that the state built something that they didn't have a maintenance plan for. And getting it off, you know, getting a thousand or fifteen hundred a year in cash, which is what Jane suggested uh, during our phone call, would cover uh, a substantial part of a of a maintenance plan going forward. We just haven't 
we ha we don't have the commitments from two or three different people to do it but i th i think it's close enough to at least spend a little time working on uh, and look at some real costs of the taxpayers in hyde park don't shoulder the whole burden but uh, it is a gateway location that we've gotten complaints about how bad it was looking before the VTrans took out all that ground cover and now we now we need to go forward with something the select board's choice is to you know ha have the once a year uh, rough maintenance by the VTrans which I think they're committed to doing once a year or come up with this middle ground I don't think highway crews should be doing it I don't think that you know the taxpayers should be paying 100 percent but for people that want to see a decent roundabout, I think it's more of a partnership proposal that needs to needs to be formed or written down so that we can get some commitments. I don't, we spent three years trying to figure out what to do with maintenance and I, I sort of want to finish this project and have a long-term maintenance plan that everybody can support. Well, how can, so the, what, village, what? can the villages and get involved in some of that? I mean, it, it, it's a benefit to them. They want this this village to look real good and everything, and we can't seem to get the village to want to help to do any improvements around. That's a good point. Well, like, yeah. yeah, I don't know that we've asked very clearly. We've sort of been in such frustrated conversations with the state that we haven't ever really said, okay, here's what we have and here's what we need. And yeah. I think if we, I think if we take that step we can do it and if over if if we look at the state gives us a commits to a thousand bucks a year over the time period of a couple of years we could simplify what's out there so that a thousand bucks a year takes care of it um just heavily mulching something i mean right now when you go through and the daffodils that are there it looks nice and having shrubbery that basically takes care of itself is you know i think is 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 the key so it can be simplified and i think if we come up with here's a and i'll bet you well we probably have people in town that could help us with that um you know here's a simplified plan here's what we have from the state to spend um how do we do it i think roly you're right about the sign um and i'd say with that i think i just let's get in touch with rich westman who sits on the senate transportation committee and say hey we need some bloody signs, you know, when we when we do this work. Give us a break. Um, we can we can hopefully push that way and t and take care of the signs because you're right. We don't need to spend the money on buying signs that we're only going to need a couple of times a year. That's crazy. Um, but to see if we can come up with a plan using the state money so that what we organize is some volunteer time and a little bit of time and have the state commit to coming up with the cash and we'll just develop a develop a beauty plan that falls within the you know the the thousand bucks a year so what happens if this goes forward with the volunteers and they're doing it for the town where's the liability come in if somebody comes through there and drives through that roundabout clips off two or three of them people that are volunteers what happens then yeah, those, all that stuff is dealt with with the 1111 permit. So the the issue with liability is really in the in the permit review process, which we already completed with VTrans in 2017. So the town has permission to put volunteers or contractors or whatever into the roundabout with the MUTCD signage package, which are those four foot signs, and the VLCT insurance would cover any liability for uh, for an event like that. The and that, that's not any different than having our town crew in the middle and having that same thing happen. So they would be covered for injuries or whatever? The taxpayers would be covered because we're following all the permitting and safety protocols. So anybody in there has to have the yellow vest, everybody have the signs are up, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's not a, you know, the worst case scenario is the same for anybody working in there. Yeah, okay. It's just like that that deal, Susan, you and I went down to the uh, rail trail when it was all washed out and they wanted us to fill that in, the town. Yeah, right, right. It's more and more and more from the state and they're pushing more and more stuff onto the town's ditching, water runoff and all this stuff. It's like, where is it going to stop? <laughs> 
Well, there is uh, no, it's going to stop when the federal no government stop. quit pushing it down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've said enough. So that's the scenario, guys. I guess there was somebody else can make up their minds what they want to do. But so the way we got it right now is that uh, we're uh, just going to stay within the what the state gives us, the thousand dollars. Is that my understanding? I don't. I don't think we're there yet, Brian. I think the the maintenance and this is my question, specific question for the board. You have uh, basically three choices, and depending on your answer to this, will tell me what we need to do. Uh, the first choice on the roundabout is to do nothing and take the Morrisville position, which is hands off. Uh, this is a state facility. Once a year is fine with us, and. If anybody complains, we'll give them the Roland Bovine answer that we're sick of it and we don't want to do anything more. <laughs> so that's option one. Option option two is to option two is to have the sort of the sort of the hybrid plan for the long term, which is you know I would have to write up a maintenance plan basically and come up with all these parts and pieces and have multiple people, uh, including the state of Vermont on their $1,000, uh, get some commitments from them and and, and come up with that uh, volunteer, cooperative, town highway, might have to pick up signs once, you know, those kind of minimal things on town highway. But look at, you know, the town taking over that as a maintenance project with partners. Uh, the third option, which, which I don't think we wanna do is just basically hire a contracting crew uh, on a, on a biweekly, basis to go out and take care of that thing and I, I don't think anybody wants to do that that would be the most expensive one yeah i like i like, like, yeah, like to see a list of kids that want to do this before we commit to it i mean how much volunteer did we get when we set those benches out there in the village of Hyde park Yeah, I think the I think the commitments to take on parts and pieces of that that middle plan is something that I would need to work on and show you at some point. Right, well, I think I, we need to I come up with the start. with the with the plan and say here's what we need, um, and and to let people know if people you know if we come up with with a volunteer base that is willing to do this, we'll move forward. If not, we're just going to ignore it. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, and to let people know <laughs> that's the choice. I know that um, I, I, you know, I would definitely, you know, if that was all grass down there, take a weed whacker. I know somebody else I've talked to, go down there with a weed whacker. We could have that all weed whacked in, the, um, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes with two people. And um, yeah. But when it comes to mulching, I'm not taking that on in that intersection. I'm not. I mean, you know, these flowers. You, you you go down through there, they grow three, four feet high. The visible, the, the sea across there coming from Johnson, you can't see when they're all out in bloom. I mean, you know, I don't know. I just, you know, I think it, the mulching is going to be the problem. So, Ron, um, how about we, this is just an idea, we table it. You do the research, Ron, of about uh, getting the volunteers to do the work. And also, I would suggest that uh, maybe get somebody. I wish that uh, Phil Sheravelli was still around, but uh, somebody to look at that on a very low maintenance uh, uh, vegetation that's put in there um, and make that an option in there so that nobody has to worry about uh, maintaining it that much. We, it, it minimizes the amount of maintenance we have to do it. Then come back to us. Uh, I don't know what would you feel would be an amount of time to to do such a uh, to get that information back to us. Uh, you'll do it by the next. Uh, uh, was it the 18th? You said. Is well, yeah. Meeting? I'll give you what I have by the 18th, and then we can go from there. Yeah. So, yeah, so, and uh, and we don't. Uh, ha Brian, we don't have to table it because it's not an action item right now. It's just a conversation. We're just trying to figure okay. out what to do. Yeah. Well, let's see. Um, Ron, come back for the select board, and we'll and we'll we'll see what we see what we have. We can yep, we can fine. start a good debate on front porch forum. 
Yeah, no, I think once we identify the needs, uh, hopefully people will step forward a little. Yeah. Yeah, well, or they will or they won't. That'll tell us right there. Yep. Okay. Have, have we run around the roundabout often enough? <laughs> Plenty. <laughs> I just I okay. just went into the guard I just went into the guardrails down there. Okay. <laughs> For the last time. You got Look dizzy. The guardrails going into the village. <laughs> yeah. Bring um, the boat okay, the paving the paving contract. Yeah, so the it's ACI yeah, th this is paving contract for spring paving related to the flood of November 1st. These are five sites uh, scattered about town. There was a bid of a, a 101,000 from ECI that the select board approved April 11th, I think. And due to COVID, yeah. every, everybody was shut down for a while. Now they're they're freed up with the 10 crew or more, you know, amendment from the governor. So their ECI said they're ready to go, and they're hoping that they could get it done by the original deadline, which was June 30. But they did ask for a couple of weeks of wiggle room. So the, con the final contract that's been drafted is for that original low bid and a July 17, July 17 deadline. Okay, any questions or we just need a motion to do it? Yeah, Make we're the using the contract yeah. to ECI. Second. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay. Whew, that was better than the roundabout. How about ditching? <laughs> uh, that, that's an in, that's a in process one. I talked to Mark French yesterday and I said, you know, if you want to, and, and this is something I think we might've talked about in April regarding the amount of work that's still to be done for the um, for the FEMA grant. That's uh, a scat the really scattered sites around town. I think Roland and, and Brian might have seen some of the ditches that are full. And the only way that Mark feels that we could get this work done uh, in, in sort of a quick order is to hire a contractor, specifically with the right equipment, uh, possibly working with the town dump trucks, I'm not sure to go and reclaim the ditching that is either filled in or damaged from the FEMA event. And this would this still would fall under the 92.5% uh, grant reimbursement. So uh, FEMA really likes a contractor total bid. It makes it a lot easier for the reimbursement process, but we could potentially use our trucks to haul the material out uh, when we get there. Uh, the only problem is Mark didn't have a clean or clear, you know, uh, project list yet. How many sites? What's the length? What what are the design standards that the contractor is supposed to do? So it's it's early, early and late at the same time. So I don't know if Brian or Roland has talked to Mark about hiring a contractor just for the FEMA work. Uh, Center Road is a separate project. We can talk about that too, but th this is just the FEMA ditching work, which would be similar to the bid we just did on the FEMA paving work. Um, Ron, he, uh, Mark hasn't con talked to me about that at all. Um, and I think that uh, um, we should probably be getting, now how long is that money available? Uh, the The project, Project lists are done and filed with FEMA. So that, that had to be done by May 15th. So all our project areas are closed right now. What is open right now through, geez, I don't know. It's it's open for the summer, possibly into December, I think, uh, for the work to be done. So there's there's not an issue with the work going forward. There is an issue that we had to identify all the sites, which we did do. So we're 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 done on that first step, which is uh, recording with FEMA the sites that we're going to be working on. So now we have a list of to be done, which FEMA has left open. And if we run into a problem doing that, there's extensions that we can ask. But the intention is to do it this construction season, and FEMA is good with that kind of a plan. Okay, so why don't we have Mark? Uh... 
uh, do like you did up on the center road for the um, for the culverts and stuff. Get them all marked out. Use a little bit of orange paint or whatever. Mark them on the road so we can start getting the some bids in on that to get that rolling. Yeah, I to, I'll we'll do it, yeah we'll do it something like that. I need to have a start and end stop a start and stop location on each side of the road to be able to you know map it out or at least do a list for contractors to look at so i think mark's going to try to do that next week and then uh if the board's good with doing that uh hopefully by the 18th we'll have a scope of work for you guys to approve to go out and get some bids so it will be done by the 18th well he i asked him if he could do it next week and he thought he could i don't know like i said i don't know what his next week will look like but um, he he's going to at least over the weekend, I think, or early next week, give me a pencil, you know, napkin sketch of what sites he knows needs to be done by a contractor. So I haven't seen that list either, but early next week, we should check in with him Monday or Tuesday and see where he's at. As you may know, I'm, I'm big on time frames. That's what moves things along. And, uh, so that's where I'm at. And, uh, so if uh, yeah, if we could have it done by the 18th, that'd be great. I just like a little commitment. That's all. Yeah, I haven't I haven't even seen the first sketch yet. So yeah, this coming Monday or Tuesday, we both should check in with Mark French and see where he's at. Because I I don't know if it's ten thousand or a hundred thousand dollars he's talking about at this point. Okay. It depends on you know what I mean. Mark is but Ryan's out for what. Ryan Ryan's working Ryan's working uh, twenty to twenty five hours a week. So you know, and Mark's trying to fill in for that. You know, sweep in and putting up everything. You know, it ties him up pretty good. You know, with one guy okay. being gone. Like, I know, I know. You know, so you know, if he needs any help, he he knows where he he can call. You know. Yep. Yeah, I don't. I'd okay. like so. We'll talk to him next week and see where he's at with that. And if he's not able to do this kind of planning work, uh, we might need to hire some help for him to keep things moving. It is construction season. Well, you know, with with trying to keep everything going that he's getting going, you know, he's it's being spread pretty thin. I know. <laughs> you know, they're doing their sweeping on the intersections. They're trying to put up sand. Then you got one guy out only working 20 hours a week that's hard for it you know i've i've had a thought that uh i've been uh pondering on and that's uh two things actually two things i think it would save the town some some money in the long run would be uh one if uh at some point uh we hire another uh person for the town crew and let me explain that we welcome already, to that uh, conversation brian <laughs> Well, uh, you you mean I might have some support? <laughs> <laughs> that got my support. See, how long have I been on the board? And we've been having that conversation, and we're 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 close to tipping into the fifth person. Well, good, good. I I, I well, like that. Okay, the the next, we'll, right. We'll next suggestion, that. right. The, the next suggestion would be is that uh, um, we acquire our own excavator for. Uh, the purpose of ditching and stuff, since we don't have the equipment to do with, I've always found that if I owned the equipment, I always made more money in my pocket. And uh, uh, maybe if we have somebody that, that we could tie the two together, and when we hire the um, the person for the fifth position, that we make sure that he can, he or she can operate a uh, uh, excavator. And there we go, we've saved money. Uh, granted, we have to spend a little bit to save some, but. Uh, um, but like I said, we've got people working uh, year round for us. We might as well make it a permanent position and, uh, and and not have to worry about it. We'll have somebody that's dependable and, and every week, and then uh, hopefully it lessens the burden on uh, on uh, Mark, and uh, he can do some of the other work that we're trying to get done. Yeah, I think the I I think the fifth person we're we're pretty close to and then being hit with this i'm not quite sure how our budget is holding up to anything right now which will be a, a, a conversation for maybe the next select board meeting to see how we're doing um the question 
for me with the excavator, it's not that it doesn't make sense, but it's do we have money put aside and what is it going to come out of? Um, uh, you know, so, so it's, and there's always a priority of here's the next piece of equipment we need to buy. Here's what it costs. Okay. So here's the money that's put aside. Where are we going to do it? Cause I sure don't think this is going to be a good year to ask taxpayers for more money. I understand. I understand. And, and yeah. but the, but, uh, you're, you're keeping a tally, uh, right. Of all the COVID-19 stuff, right? Uh, yeah, we've we've got three things going on actually with COVID. One is the the simple wages and uh, mandated extra time off. Then there's expenses which are being coded to C19. And then Kim has said that she's monitoring uh, tax revenues which are due next week to see if there's any big drop in that. So I don't I don't know if she would have seen that now, but might see it next week. Okay. Well, okay, and we gotta, and of course the tax drop off. off. We may be okay this time, but the one after that could be the one where it really catches us. Yeah, which way we go with this whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. Is Kim, is Kim still on? I don't know. If she, I can't. Yeah, I guess she. Yes, is. I am. Have you seen anything yet on revenues? Unusual. So nothing's really changed. We have so many um, homeowners who, who, the ones obviously that own their homes. Um, and have mortgages, a lot of people are set up on escrow payments. So they've been making their escrow payments right along as part of their mortgage payment, and the escrow company makes the tax payments. Um, I have about 100, I think it's like 180 or 190 people set up on the ACH debit. So I they send us the information and I go in and I pull the tax payment from their account. I sent out notices um, Monday the 4th telling people that if they didn't want their payment to be taken, they had to you know, contact me by a specific day and time or the money is going to be pulled. I haven't heard from anybody. Um, I've only heard at the very beginning of this, one person asked if anything was going to change with the May 15th tax installment. And it was so early that the only thing we had heard was BLCT's um, opinion that, you know, for towns like ours, who are everything voted by the voters, there's nothing we can do um, unless the legislature makes some changes that allow something to happen at the board level. Um, and just a week and a half ago, I had one person ask about has the board made any decision about you know waiving late fees or whatever and at the time still nothing's been decided at the state so i told that one person the same thing i've not had anybody else ask me and i think susan's right if we're going to see something it might be august especially I since families have just told. gotten those huge families have just gotten those huge influx of you know stimulus dollars from the federal government. Some people who normally go delinquent on May 15th, I've seen those payments coming in and it's like, wow, that's good. Yeah, it is very good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I, expected, to, I, I, expect, I expected to hear uh, worse news actually, but that, I thought that's excellent. Money yeah. still coming in. So I'll know more, you know, the closer we get to this coming Friday and you know what it looks like so okay I promise I'll pay my taxes <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay good well, let's see the uh our our face mask program and Carol's on the phone here too um it, is being very well received. People are very appreciative of uh, of, of having access. Um, it's uh, we have we have a terrific group of volunteers who are stitching up a storm, um, and and um, I I think what we're talking about doing is doing a postcard mailing to everybody in town because I suspect as um, as we become more and more open, 
folks are going to be looking more and more for for access to face masks. And uh, I think it's a it's a simple thing. It's really just our coordination that that's taking place, and then we cover the cost of a postcard mailing, which I think is what about five hundred bucks, Ron. Yeah, it's been a while, but it'd be in that ballpark, maybe a little under. Yeah, um, and and let folks know um, we've set up a simple system for delivering. It turns out we're we're even better than Amazon. Um, <laughs> and again, folks are just folks are really appreciative of it, and I think it's uh, I think it's a relatively simple thing that we can do for our residents. And it's it's also encouraging you know healthy behavior and support in you know in folks when you make it when you make it easy to get a face mask which lots of people are hearing you know they're trying to order and then they're being told they can't get them or they can have them in a month or something so um, I'd I'd like to have us go ahead and spend the money and do the mailing and and uh, we'll keep plugging away getting masks to people. Right now, what happens is Carol, Carol and I split up the list. She sort of takes one half of the town, and I take the other half of the town, and we we uh, we we have the masks, and we package them up, and we found just a little simple flyer that puts in that tells people here's how you need to wash them, and here's what you need to do. And um, I just put it. We put them in a brown paper bag and put the person's name on it, and uh, write a little "Please wash me first on it, and then we drop it off at people's doors. Um, have been told we can't put them in people's mailboxes. So and and um, and again, usually when they come in, usually by that day or depending if Ron closes the list at the beginning of the at the end of the day, the next day we just drive around and drop them off for people. We're not we're not putting ourselves or anybody else at any kind of risk in driving around and dropping something off at somebody's doorstep. So. Susan, how many have you guys given out? Just out of curiosity. Probably about seventy. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, and that, and that's not even with a with a lot of publicity. You know, there's there's front porch forum, but you know, lots of people don't get and and I don't know Carol, but if I'm already seeing, I'm going back to neighborhoods. So like a neighbor gets them for the family, and the next day or the day after that, uh, it's funny. There I am driving back to the house next door, giving you know giving the next family some. So I, again, I think as the word spreads, and we were going, besides doing the mailing, we're going to do, if you look at the postcard thing, make that up just as a regular little flyer and put it up at the post office when the library reopens, put it there so that it, it's, um, it's easy for folks to, you know, to have access to the information. Does that work for everybody? Okay, we all have our face masks. There's going to be a whole new business that starts there, I think, with you know getting color coordinated fashion statement masks before this all ends. Uh, let me see. Ooh, we got the next is is the labor negotiations we need to set a first date do we want to wait and go into executive session at the end well we could go ahead and set a date or well when we come out we could set the date but then talk about what they've set and set that up do that in executive yeah that's fine with me i just wanted to make sure it was so don't forget we need to get going on this <laughs> right right okay we'll do that how about down to the the fundraiser for the that folks the looking for permission to use the park and ride. What's that yeah, all about? It? Yeah, Kim took an application from uh, a, a family really that wants to the kids. The kids initiated a or had in works a, a fundraising that got canceled because of the COVID nineteen restrictions, and now they want to uh, do something for the uh, big change roundup. So they're asking to use the park and ride lot i think it's going to be just one day so like an all-day saturday coin drop or a bottle drop i think is that right kim yeah they told me it would just be you know one day um they haven't picked the day i don't remember the application that they set a time frame 
but their thoughts were, you know, they provide the spot for the drop off. They're standing back at a distance. They're wearing their masks. They're hoping that everybody else is wearing their masks. And they're just taking the bottles and, and cans and collecting them. And like Ron said, it's, it's, it's more of a fundraiser for the big change roundup that, you know, kind of didn't have a really good uh, collection time this year because of COVID. I'm fine with it. Who's running yeah, that? Yeah, for uh, me. Art? Sure. Mark running that? Or? Uh, what was the family's name? Um, Bolio? Uh, Dix Dixie was her first name. I don't remember the last name. Oh, that's all right. I, I'm fine with that. They're not going to bother nobody. Sure. So I guess we need a motion for permission to use the park and ride for that big change roundup. Yeah. Okay, second. we got that in a second. Okay. Um, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All right. Anybody opposed or abstaining? Okay. All right. We need to authorize an agent to sign the town 1111 permits. Boy, have I got a suggestion. <laughs> oh, Brian. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I think Brian can do this. Right, Brian? Brian's disappeared. <laughs> Did we lose Brian? There I am. I'm back. There oh, he there is. Are. I had it. Hey, I, I there had you it go. Muted. Okay. I had it, I, I had it muted. Believe it or not, I've uh, uh, been on the road and uh, uh, had to take Penny up to the hospital. So uh, um, oh. uh, multitasking is one of my great greatest achievements. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, yes, uh, the 11 um that's pretty much just getting access to uh, from people's properties to the town roads. Is that correct? Basically, correct, yeah. I used to do that for yeah. uh, Elmore, so, so yes, I'll do it. Okay, I need a, need a motion to authorize Brian to be the... Motion to authorize Brian to sign the permit. Second. Okay, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, we're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and yes, you can vote yes for yourself. That's how we approve of that. Okay, the uh, to approve the uh, $175,000 grant application for the Center Road due May 15th. So oh, just a quick, uh, this is the third year in a row that we've tried to wrestle money out of the state of Vermont for the same project. So part of the delay, if you will, could, could be attributed to their lack of <laughs> approvals because it's it's getting to be close to, I guess it's seven or eight years since the last time they approved any money. And we're probably due this year, but the way VTrans is so non-committal, they're like, well, we don't know if we're going to get any money, blah, 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 but still, you know, submit your request by the 15th of May. So that's what we're doing. The application uh, is really for the, uh, the the milling, reclaiming work, uh, paving, state grants require a minimum of four inches to go back down. So we'd have to show them invoices that result in four inch overlay. I I think the uh, scope of work that we originally prepared had the whole road broken up into two phases, the, the south half, if you will, from Cleveland Corners to the town line, and then the north half from Cleveland Corners to McKinstry Hill. Um, so this grant is focused on the southern half. The estimated cost is over 300000 so with an 80% grant, we'll have more than enough uh, money for the match. Uh, which would come out of our paving line and we'll have, so two, we'll, have, we'll have 24 months to actually get the, the paving work done so, if it's awarded so you're 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 good two years then yeah two summers yeah and and that's the whole that's the whole project all the way up through there with the 300 no, no, this is a set, the lower half from Cleveland Corners to the town line. 
And that, and that wasn't, is. that does not include any ditching work. This is just the top stuff. Doesn't, doesn't include any culverts or anything like that either. No, no, that's, that's going to be done under a separate contract. And, you know, the, yep. and I don't know where that money's coming from, but that's what we're working on now with watershed consulting. So that's, a. I'm, I'm all I'm trying to do is get this application in by the 15th so we know if we have that money if it comes through then we automatically have a kind of a pusher you know Brian Brian saying he likes deadlines we'll have a clock that starts 24 months if that grant grants awarded so what does that include that includes the reclaiming the black topping the gravel or what's it yeah yeah that typically what happens is they're the paving alone once you do that reclaim and the paving will exceed our grant match amount. So if you have 175,000, you end up needing to spend 210,000 total. Uh, but the estimate is 300 just for the top on that on that lower half. So it's not, it's not a full project, it's a partial project and it's just the paving part. Uh, redoing the base and paving does not include any culvert work. That, that doesn't mean that we won't have that work done under a, a different way, but it, this, this grant is specific to the paving. So is it specified? Did you have to specify it, obviously, in that grant, um, what we're doing? Yeah, the, the, the grant application that went in the last couple of years was the re, reclaiming down to eight or 10 inches, checking for good drainage, uh, good gravel below there, so that we know we're gonna be putting back a good you know, base for paving and then paving with four inches of pavement on top. So who will give you the estimate for reclaiming, Ron? Uh, we were using actual costs from other projects we were working on. But I can, you know, I can, I can open up my spreadsheet. I can tell you one second here. I just wondered if things are going to be cheaper with the way things are going for blacktop. I mean, you know. I can't see that stuff. That blacktop usually works with oil, you know, the price of oil. And they've got so much oil out in the ocean, they don't know what to do with it. Yes, I know. I know. So the, the reclaiming, um, we had about, this is just the lower half now because we broke it up because the, the grant doesn't have enough money to do the whole road. Okay. 1.3 miles from Cleveland Corners Road to the town line. Is about thirty thirty six thousand dollars for the reclaim, one hundred and sixty four for the base paving, and then a hundred thousand for the top. It's about three hundred thousand total, and you take one hundred seventy five off that for the grant. Right, and, and that doesn't include any gravel being put on top during the reclaiming process. No, the it, this is just doing the, t the top 10 inches. So what, basically what happens, you make an assumption that the top layer of pavement is less than 10 inches. So let's say you had two lifts of total of seven or eight inches of pavement or less, and then you go down the full depth of 10 inches and scoop up some of the gravel under that. During that process, you're inspecting you know the the lower layer there. I know there's some, un there's some fabric in the road. I don't know if that's that part or the Northern part. You don't want to disturb the fabric, uh, typically. And then if the if the minus 10 inches is showing a bunch of junk, clay, and big rocks, uh, my guess is that you'd stop work, figure out what's going on, and add gravel so that you're on good material before you put that um, top layer on for the the crown. So uh, we don't we don't you just don't know until you get down there. I, we don't. We don't have a lot of good history on our roads, so if we if we do the 10 inch reclaim, you're going to get a good top. The 10 inches and above will be really good material, but you don't want to put that on top of a, a wet spot or clay. So you, it's, it's the, the best. This is a perfect well, perfect world estimate, I guess you'd call it at 300,000 that you don't find problems there. So if there is a, a spot where there's clay and uh, uh, material that we don't uh, want or favor then uh, would we also uh, remove that uh, reclaim and um, and put fabric down and then yeah, put it back yeah, you, over? Yeah, exactly. You'd want to get the clay down to 12 to 24 inches of good material 
underneath that top 10 inches. So the way I look at it, it's layering, you know, so the top 10 inches is really your road. You know, that's where you want your structure to be. You want good contour for the crown. Below that, you still yep. want 18 to 24 inches of good material, which means no clay. So if you find a big clay spot, the project would basically stop. We'd get excavators in there and take out as much of that stuff as you as you don't want down to that 18 inches, uh, call it minus 18 inches, and then put new gravel back and maybe fluff it all up with new, you know, ground, you know, ground material to make it all good. You don't you, just adding the fabric piece over that is probably not the best, but you could reduce your 18 inches of sub base uh, with the fabric. So. That's why the project would stop if you find something bad. We'd all have to scratch our heads and look at it. Yes, I I didn't mean to imply that the fabric would be on top of anything, but the clay and the, uh, everything new would be put on top of it. Uh, done it before. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that that uh, sounds good. Um, and I understand that uh, that. Uh, certain stretches of that road was upgraded anyway so the base should be okay and it hopefully it was the area where the um the swampy area was in that in that area and i believe that's what i was told by ken harvey that, uh, they put a good base underneath uh, that area there where it was swampy about halfway up i mean really the best thing that could happen is you get the grant award for 175 and it forces this project off the to-do list because <laughs> it's been yeah. on it for a long time. <laughs> This, let's see, the fifth person. Okay, we're going to get some of these off the list someday, Ron. <laughs> so what we just need is a motion to approve submitting the grant. Um, yeah, the choice. And then we'll was, cross our fingers and hope we get it this year. Right. The, the reason it's on the select board agenda is because you do have a choice to make on these grants to, you know, keep working on Center Road or, or give up and go somewhere else with the 175. So I just want to make sure everybody's still zeroed in on Center Road. No, nope. after this time, we're not giving up on the center road. <laughs> <laughs> Make the motion. Yeah, okay, I move that we go ahead. <laughs> no, that's that's all. It's a motion to approve the application for 175 on the center road. So I'll move. Second. Okay, get a second. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We got anybody opposed? I don't know what we're going to do if we get it. <laughs> You're right. We'd actually have to move. That'd be interesting. Uh, let me see. Okay, we got anything other than than uh, we need to talk about the the uh, the union contract? Do we have other than that that we need to talk about so we could go into executive session? No, I think that's, you know, for the people that are online, I think if the board votes in the executive session, then uh, we'll close it out and leave just the select board and anybody they want to invite online and the recording should stop uh, as far as I think Carol can control that. Yep, I'll take care of that. I'll make a motion. Bye. 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 Take care, Kim. Thanks. Make a motion to go into executive session. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. <laughs>